Hey, welcome back to the About the Labor podcast here at VikingsTerritory.com. I am BJ Rydell, back here with my guy, Drew Mahold. And today we're talking about another Minnesota Vikings victory. How about that, right? Um, you know, it, I'm still kind of getting over it. Uh, I'm working my way into this Detroit game um, on Sunday here. Obviously, Case Keenum, a phenomenal per- performance. That deserves two episodes worth of the uh, About the Labor podcast of uh, discussion. So we'll get go more into Pat Shermer's um, kind of it, it, the optimism that he's put into uh, both of us here. Um, and, uh, you know, a little bit more on Case Keenum, Dalvin Cook, as always, and, uh, you know, run through some of these offensive totals that uh, we've seen through uh, three weeks of play here. And uh, then we'll start looking forward to Detroit a little bit, uh, wrap this thing up, and uh, we'll be back next episode with our um, – pregame preview per uh per standard every single week so before we get into that let's first get a word from our sponsor out of the way here uh black stack brewing brand new brewery smack dab in the middle of minneapolis st paul with a wide range of clean and flavorful brews and a massive bright tap and perfect for intimate settings all the way to special events that's black stack brewing 755 north prior just north of menards off of university avenue and then just keep in mind uh we don't have any details out just yet but we're planning on having a vikings viewing party for the monday night chicago game um, obviously the Vikings will be at Soldier Field, so that would be a good opportunity to come grab a beer down at Blackstack, um, possibly join us uh, as well. So it should be some fun. Uh, let's talk some Vikings, Drew. Um, start off, like I said, with Pat Shermer. You know, we talked about on the last show um, just how great he has been and, you know, how it's probably a good idea for some of the Vikings fans, or at least um, some people thought this was weird when I said this, but... Um, just I see a lot of Pat Shermer hate across my timelines, you know, as people that yeah. write, as someone that also puts stuff, content on the internet, you see the comment sections of people just throwing absurd accusations out there. Um, people have been negative towards Pat Shermer. I, am, am I wrong to say that? No. No, okay. No, that, that's, that's normal, I think. I mean, it, it's like, I feel like what we had with Norv was – like stressing the downfield passing and going too far with an offensive line that wouldn't limit it or I wouldn't play for it. And then um, last year you saw a, when Schirmer took over, it was the most drastic change almost possible. Yeah. Where well, yeah the passing, course. I mean, Bradford's air yards probably cut in half per pass attempt, you know? And I mean, I think people wanted a kind of a happy medium. And I think, you know, I, I feel like we're getting that now at least through three weeks. Well, people see people, I feel like Vikings fans have been looking for that 1998 Vikings offense since that 1998 Vikings offense left, right? Well, like, yeah. And, I mean, and can, can I really blame you guys? No, no, I can't. Because why would you not want to have that Randy Moss, Chris Carter, Jake Reed situation where you're basically hucking it down to wh- whoever's open? And to some degree, you know, the Vikings have been moving towards something like that. We talked about you know, in June, how this is probably the best re- wide receiver course they've had in how, I mean, this might be the best receiving core they've had since 1998 with Stefan Diggs, Adam Thielen and uh wide receiver three remains to be seen. I mean, I made mean, I made a nice case for Treadwell last week, but right. Uh, I mean, the thing is though, like, like this, I feel like the offense is unique in that on, from what I've seen on every single snap or every single pass drop back the first two reads in the progression are Thielen and Diggs on seemingly every drop back. So right. um, it's almost like wide receiver three isn't really a part of the offense. And maybe that's because it is Treadwell right now, or maybe it's because they're waiting on Michael Floyd to come back. We don't know that, but it seems like those two are going to get heavy, heavy targets throughout the season if they're healthy, because they've been such a big part of the offense and big part of the game plan, just simply because of the progression. It's just either Diggs one, Thielen two or vice versa. And they're always getting open. I mean, if you right. look, if you've gone back and look at the film at all, there are multiple, multiple scenarios where the first let's let's say for example the first read is Adam Thielen and I'm in this you know uh, this idea that I'm bringing up here. Um, even when Thielen has been you know the first read, Diggs has also been was also open on a lot of these plays. So it was like Case Keenum got to pick which window he thought was going to be tighter to throw into, and then you know pick from two very good targets in Adam Thielen and Stephon Diggs. I mean, we talked about on the last show how these guys are quickly becoming a top five receiver duo in the league, and they, it's not necessarily because they're the most talented 
duo. I mean, I don't think I need to bring that up. You know, Detroit Lakes kid, and we got the fifth rounder from Maryland that nobody thought was going to actually be as explosive as, you know, his rival's profile suggested when he was in high school. Mm-hmm. But that's what that's the nature of the situation here is that maybe Thielen and Diggs aren't Julio Jones talented, but they're getting open better than anyone. They're always open. And even when they're not, they're able – like we've seen – like Drew said on the last couple episodes here, Drew uh, – Stephon Diggs has gotten better with the catch in traffic situation, catching balls, you know, with receivers bearing or excuse me, defensive backs bearing down on him. Um, we've seen Case Keenum be able to fit the ball into some tight windows, actually, which was probably the most impressive part of Case Keenum's game last week was just, you know, he got There's a, a lot of a lot of impressive things. Yes, he showed. there really is. I mean, just right from the get go, you know, what was it? A minute 15 into the game, he drops that beauty of a dime into Adam Thielen's hand down the left sideline. I mean, he was on fire throughout the game. And it's it just, you know, is this, first of all, the first thing I want to say, is this sustainable? You know, because we don't know for sure if Bradford's going to be back on Sunday or if he's going to be back relatively soon. Do you see this as, as, a, as a sustainable <laughs> thing for P- Pat Shermer, Case Keenum, Stefan Diggs, etc.? Do you think this can continue? I mean, realistically, the answer is no, but I do think that sustainable or improvement from last year is sustainable in that, like, um, you know, last year was a super um, condensed passing game where Bradford would take three steps and he'd probably he'd let go of the ball. You know, it was a lot of it was based on timing. And um, uh, now I, I feel like a lot of that was because of the offensive line. And I think we're seeing that now, that better protection – and giving the quarterback, you know, he doesn't have to worry about the offensive line knocking him over or, you know, a guy getting to him in two and a half seconds um, right away like that. I think that's really helping these longer developing pass plays, you know, develop. And, you know, you, you have Adam Thielen getting open down the field from the slot for a 35-yard gain. You have Stephon Diggs um, running that corner route on a, you know, kind of a little bootleg action for 20 yards. And then he breaks a tackle and scores a touchdown. It's, it's um, the I think the the game changer here is the offensive line. Riley Reef is playing well. Mike Grammer's had a phenomenal game last week. Yeah, um, it's Tampa Bay, um, and Pat Alfine as well. You know, I think he's been better than you know. I think he's working the run game needs some work, but um, and and passing game and pass, pass protection he's been really good. So, bottom line here is I think the offensive line, if it can pr- sustain its performance, I think the offense will only sustain its overall output as well. So I think it relies. I think the performance relies on the offensive line here. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and, you know, when it comes down to it, a lot of, you know, a lot of teams rely on their offensive line. I mean, we've seen what's happened to Seattle over the last couple of weeks here. Um, I, I was talking, this, talking about this on Twitter the other day, just is Seattle actually like, is their offensive line so bad that they became right. a mediocre average team in the NFL? And that's kind of what we saw happen to the Vikings last year. Is it not? I mean, the Vikings yeah. went from a, you know, a shootout, the lights offense, the top, the first five weeks, and then as the offensive line became, you know, uh, That's incom- probably exactly what happened. I mean, you can have you know, you can have all the talent you want around you, especially on offense. But then, if, if you, you can't have an offensive line that can protect the quarterback for three seconds or more, and then have also that same offensive line open up some lanes for your running back and have a running game. You're not going to win a lot of games, you know. I think that's what happened at the Vikings last year. It's probably a good observation. I think the Seahawks might fall victim to the same thing. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it's something that you just keep an eye on. I mean, I'm not here. I'm not here to you know suggest that Seattle's actually a bad team. I'm just here to you know kind of keep an eye. Say basically keep an eye out because it, it you can look at how talented some of these rosters are, but then you always get back to seeing teams like. You know, for example, Dallas still finds a way to win football games because of their offensive line. Green Bay, generally speaking, when they're both of their bookends are in there, they're going to win most of their football games as well. I know that they've been struggling through the last couple of weeks as well here, but and that's Philadelphia kind of... now too. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm for what I'm still not super high on Carson Wentz, but he's got one of the better pass protecting units in the league in front of him. So, and then and then on the reverse side, right there, I mean, the New York Giants. I mean, how yeah. how garbage have they been? And it's been a lot on Eric Flowers, their left tackle. I've seen a ton of hate thrown his direction. Uh, some funny hate, some not so funny hate. You know how it goes. But, but the point being here is that the Vikings' offensive line. I mean, let's let's talk about this real quick. We came into this year 
kind of dreading the Vikings offensive line being the worst unit in the league, right? Because we were so used to that last year with TJ Clemmings and whoever the hell was over at right tackle. Um, it was a disaster last year, and I think most fans came into this year saying, is this Vikings offensive line going to be this bad again? And we continuously said, it's going to be better. We don't know how much better, but it, it has to be better than last year. And now this year, it sure as hell seems like the Vikings don't have a bottom tier offensive line, right? I don't like, there's no, there's no poll on Twitter saying who has the worst offensive line and the Vikings are never an option. You know, my point being here is, are, are the fight is the Vikings offensive line good enough now under Tony Sperano, who I think deserves a lot of credit here since we, given that we gave him, you know, a lot of flack last year for what he was unable to accomplish, probably deserves a head nod from some of us. Um, uh, do you think that this offensive line is actually, you know, let's say a top 20 unit in the NFL right now? Oh, yeah, I think so. Um, I still I think against the run, they're probably not top 20. I think they're kind of borderline there. Uh, I think the interior um, is probably – you'll need some improvement there, Nick Easton, Pat Elfline. Um, but I think in, the, in pass protection, they're really – they're definitely top 20, maybe top 15, close to top 10, honestly. I think Riley Reef has been – this last game against Tampa Bay really evolved them up. I think Mike Remmers played really well. Rather, he's played really well. I think Keenan was uh, pressured only six dropbacks of his 33 attempts, and he was not sacked. So, I mean, that's right there. Those numbers are going you know, to win you a lot of games. Yeah. So, I like um, I like the way Remmers is playing. I, you know, he was one of the big worries we had coming into the season. Was you know we knew he could perform in the run game. We knew he was a mauler at right tackle. We did not know how he would protect the passer and. To this point, I mean, there's been a few snaps where it's been iffy, but he's been, he's done, you know, he's exceeded my expectations. Yeah, and honestly, he should have exceeded most people's expectations given that he's getting paid $6 million a year versus, you know, what most right tackles are paid. Uh, most right tackles are not paid $6 million a year to do the job that he's doing right now. I think that he's actually outperformed, you know, his expectations both financially and kind of just the overall expectations of Mike Remmers based off of what we've seen from him against Carolina in the Super Bowl and the fact that he's been on the Vikings before and been released before. Just all those preconceived notions, I think, kind of ramped up to us being not too confident in Mike Remmers. And through three weeks, eh, not too bad. You know, I'm, I'm okay with Mike, Mike Remmers through three weeks. I'm definitely okay with Riley Reef through three weeks. Yeah. Um, I would make the argument that Riley Reef has been potentially the best offseason signing of any team so far just because of the amount like just the impact that him playing, the difference between the offense yes. from last year to this year and it's the yeah. same offensive coordinator yep but i mean you have same you offensive have, line you have coach. Hook in there a running back but relatively the same weapons yeah i mean it, it's it's riley reef has made a monstrous difference without showing up in the stat column um I mean, obviously, with offensive linemen, there's about two statistics that you can look – basic statistics, I should say, to look for, and that's pancakes and sacks allowed. And Riley Reef is doing okay in both categories right now. So, um, you know, at the end of the day, you got to watch the film, I think, to, for, to decide on, you know, whether your offensive yeah. line is performing at a high enough level for uh, – for your standard, at least relative to what you think as a Vikings fan. But for me, um, Riley Reef is doing a hell of a job. Reich Remmers is doing a hell of a job. Um, I'm really excited about Pat Alfline as well. Nick Easton, for me, has been really the only question mark on the offensive line. Uh, I think that he's had some trouble, uh, let's put it that way. Um, it hasn't yeah. been enough of an issue to really sway the rest of the offensive line from not playing well. For what well. it's worth, Nick Easton's run, uh, run block grade on PFF is under 30. It's 29.3. Yeah, so... so. And you can see, and honestly, you know what? You can kind of see that too. When you watch the film, you can kind of see. No leverage at all. Yeah, he's not getting to the second level well. He's getting pushed around when there's zone blocking. You know, he's been the weakest link. And while I think it's fair to still bring up the whole Alex Boone thing, you know, we could have Alex Boone in there right now. And I think most people would agree with me in saying that he probably would be the better offensive lineman um, next to Riley Reef. But the fact of the matter here is. That they have not been like Nick Easton's in the inefficiency has not collapsed this offensive line, which is a positive. And because Nick Easton is a younger guy with you know some talent, um, the Vikings went out and got him for a reason. Um, mm -hmm. There's still reason to believe that he will be a better player down the line here, and that you know eventually it's going to be 
the right move for the Vikings, getting rid of Alex Boone and inserting Nick Easton in the starting lineup just because, you know, he has room to grow. He's a younger guy. Alex Boone has got about, what, five years on him. Um, we'll see what happens, but I think I, I'm, I'm ready. I'm willing to admit that, you know, Easton has not been up to snuff and that he certainly needs to improve his play. Right, but, I mean, the fact that he is at left guard and you can you can hide a, you know, lackluster left guard better yeah. than a lackluster left tackle or right tackle or whatever. So, right. With with Reef with Remmers, um, with Elfline with Berger, I think you have a completely revamped offensive line that is, you know, average right now in the NFL, which is a heck of a lot better than I expected. So, um, with that, Pat Shermer has taken advantage of it. He has a healthy Diggs. He has Adam Thielen. He has Delvin Cook, and this a Vikings offense is as he claimed it would be back in February. Um, it is explosive, and I mean the the stats don't lie. The film doesn't lie. Um, they have the third highest rate of explosive plays in the NFL, which would be a 15 yard play or more third highest rate <laughs> through we- three weeks. Which is, it's, and it's funny because the Rams are actually first with Jared Goff, but then the Patriots are second <laughs> Vikings are third. Uh, they are sixth in the NFL in yards per play 6.2. They are second in total offense. They are third in passing yards, fifth in 20 yard plays or more of, with 15 of them and second in 40 yard plays or more with four. And then additionally, um, the combination – okay, so Sam Bradford is second in deep ball rate, which is percentage of throws 15 yards or farther down the field. And Case Keenum is fourth. And if you combine them together as one quarterback playing for the Vikings, it is third behind Brady and Deshaun Kaiser. So – Deshaun Kaiser? <laughs> he, dude, the Browns are launching him down the field apparently. So, uh, But this offense is completely different than what we saw down the stretch of last season because – I can't imagine Bradford was very high on the, you know, the deep ball rate list you yeah. know, compar- in comparison to the NFL. Yeah, he, uh, he definitely was not. Um, what's, what's also interesting about that is what's the completion percentage, too? I mean, Keenum and Bradford combined, I know that, you know, they're, they're throwing the ball well down the field. And they're like, you know, on average, they're trying to, get, to work the ball down the field. But they're also completing a ton of oh, passes. Um, this, is, this has been a very, you know, efficient vertical offense. Um, you know, and I think what's so interesting here is that you see the Vikings go from you know the the Air Coriel school of thought to the West Coast school of thought with Pat Shermer, and you kind of expect the air yards to drop a little bit. Um, yeah. So more for the year, the Vikings quarterbacks are completing seventy percent of their passes. I mean, yeah. it's Bradford at eighty four percent on that Monday night game, and then Keenum has that sixty five. So, so there you go, seventy percent of completion, and on overall, you got the third. Um, you know, the third offense in terms of, like, volume. Um, I I mean, what can you say about Pat Shermer, man? I mean, I, we brought this up, I brought this up earlier in the show. You know, people have been calling for his head essentially since he moved from tight end coach to offensive coordinator. And it's been under a year since that's happened, just for the record. Um, and he's, you know... He's gotten the opportunity to install his offense throughout the offseason here. Um, we've actually – we're starting to see, you know, his play calling style and sort of the concepts he likes to involve to to set up defenses. And he's doing a heck of a job. So he, this is my – this is the kind of the point that I'll pose here is, is it time to reevaluate Pat Shermer's status in Minnesota? And when I say his status, I'm, I don't necessarily mean his status uh, relative to the, you know – I guess, I don't want to say the intelligent NFL fan, but I guess the the informed NFL fan, um, not not the comment section NFL fan. That guy's always different than you know the guy that you actually. Right. You know what I'm saying? Okay, so um, do you think it's time to re- reevaluate his status in Minnesota? Does he deserve more respect? Essentially, is what I'm asking. Yeah, I mean, I think so. Um, I think it's you cautiously give him. I mean, does that make sense? You cautiously, cautiously respect what he's done but also understand that it's been three weeks and you have a, you know, you have three division games in a row coming up. And if he can get through that still kind of keeping a similar pace on offense, then I think it's really time to, okay, this guy's for real. This offense is for real. Um, But I mean, I I think, I don't know who deserves credit, I guess, for the move um, of Adam Thielen into the slot and digs back outside. But I think that is partially, you know, uh, deserves a lot of the credit for what this offense is able to do. In the slot with Thielen, you have all kinds of mismatches. The guy's 6'2", 200 and what, 10, 20 pounds. He's a big dude in the slot there, and that causes mismatches. I mean, the Saints had to put a linebacker on him. Um, 
and th- there's not really a, a matchup for him unless you play Arizona and you have Patrick Peterson moving into the slot. But then you have Diggs on the outside who has supreme acceleration out of cuts and and you have apparently now an ability to make catches that are contested, but you know, when um, there's like a 50, 50 ball Diggs can make those catches now, apparently, which I did not know before this season. So those two guys flipping them from outside to slot now with Diggs outside thing in the slot. I think that was, you know, partially the reason for this offense um, exploding the way it is. And of course, Dalvin cook in the run game. Um, if you have a running game of any kind, you know, that obviously helps you with the, you know, setting up explosive plays. Absolutely. Um, I guess there's something – it's worth noting to some degree that the Vikings did hire a new wide receiver coach this offseason, um, Daryl Hazel, or Hazel. I'm not yeah. sure how to pronounce his last name there. Uh, but, you know, it, I guess it's worth noting that, you know, the Vikings receivers weren't bad last year. They weren't bad this year before that. They just kind of didn't really have the quarterback or they didn't have the offensive line or something was going on there. But, you know – it's probably worth noting here that the new receivers coach is probably doing some damage as well. He's probably, you know, involved uh, to some degree in that decision to move um, Adam Thielen primarily into the slot, like you said. Um, we've seen Stephon Diggs work out of there a little bit as well, mm-hmm. but um, just the versatility and the flexibility. The thi- is it, you know, I feel like the Vikings kind of telegraphed a lot of this to us four or five months ago. Oh, uh, I think they did too, but we just were like, whatever, man. Yeah, and like, yeah, and it's. And, I mean, when when I say we, I don't mean like people listening to this show and that Drew and I were right the whole time. I mean, like all of us, we were all like, oh, I know. Every single Vikings fan was like, yeah, okay, we'll see about that explosiveness. Yeah, okay, we'll we'll see about those thousand yard receivers. Yeah, all right, we'll we'll see about Dalvin Cook replacing Adrian Peterson. I mean, through it's three weeks. It's a small sample size. But they've done everything they said they were going to do. They're more explosive on offense. They're better at running the football. They're pass protecting way better. They're run blocking way better. I think, you know, I'm going to say this one more time. It's a small sample size, but through three weeks, they are shutting everyone up. Mm-hmm. They're literally yeah. just, they're literally sitting back and reading their, their pegboard of all the rude comments you know, they get from us, um, from just the, you know, the keyboard warrior nation, um, yeah. ev- everyone, everyone. And it's sitting there on the pegboard. And they're basically just checking it off. That's what the Vikings have done through three weeks, in my opinion. You know, you're sitting there at two and one. You're essentially on top of the division right now, heading into a, you know, an early season game that's probably more important. You know, I feel like in hindsight, we'll look back on this Detroit game that's coming up, and this will be a much more important game than we're giving it credit for, you know, heading into week four. A lot of people say don't stress over September games, but this is a pretty important no, September this is game. A big game. Uh, we, we, you know, we go back every, you know, how often do we do this on the show where we go back and say that the Detroit games last season were the difference maker between making the postseason or not in 2016. Well, I, we're playing Detroit in September, so this September game might actually have some impact. I think it's worth, uh, you know, kind of getting up for a little bit here because this is going to be an important game and the Vikings are playing at home, you know, um, which is something that I want to talk about with you real quick is. How much of an impact do you think playing at U.S. Bank Stadium versus playing at Heinz Field made for Case Keenum? Because I have this um, theory, and I, I think it's better than an opinion. I think it's a theory at this point. I think there's some some actual knowledge behind it to some degree. But I have this theory that the Vikings, you know, playing at U.S. Bank Stadium was just a whole different experience for Case Keenum. You know, consider the fact that he's at the line making his calls with, you know, Pat Alfline and probably Joe Burgess probably involved in there to some degree as well, where complete silence, you don't have to worry about the crowd noise, um, you don't have to like, you, basically you can sit there and you can find the mic, you can do all, you can go through your progressions and all that stuff in complete silence. And Vikings fans, for what it's worth, you know, I haven't been at a game yet this year, but for what it's worth, it seems like Vikings fans do a heck of a job actually quieting down. And, you know, making a good atmosphere for their quarterback to work in. And, I, again, just to get back to the original question here is how much do you think the Vikings playing at U.S. Bank Stadium last week actually impacted Case Keenum's performance um, against what he would, you know, didn't really do at Heinz Field the week prior? Yeah, I mean, I, I remember this, seeing this clip, I think. So Peter Schrager was the Fox sideline guy for the game against the Bucks, And he's also a personality on the... I think it's the NFL Network Good Morning Football. I think it's what it's called. Good Morning Football Show. 
Um, and he, um, he made a point on that show on Monday morning to, um, you know, praise the Vikings crowd, say this is the one of the best home field advantages in the NFL, if not the best, saying that, you know, the crowd goes completely silent when the Vikings offense is on the field. But then, you know, you can't even think when the defense is on the field. Yeah. So um, obviously I'm sure that plays a part in it. But that's kind of why I'm optimistic. It's because you look at this schedule. Um, you have Detroit at home this week. You have at Chicago, which we know about Soldier Field and the curse and everything. We get that. <laughs> but then you have then you have home Green Bay, home Baltimore, and then at Cleveland, which is technically – which was in, in London. So – you know, then then their bye week, and then hopefully Bradford and or Teddy by then are healthy enough to play, and so and they have obviously more experience dealing with the road um, conditions and whatnot. So, you know, with Keenum playing at home and that advantage, you have essentially what? You had, you, counting Tampa Bay, you had four games out of five at home, which you know, I mean, I think there's reason for optimism and there's reason to believe that this team will be in good shape entering the bye after that Cleveland game if Keenum is in for what is it, two or three more weeks. Yeah, I mean, and and on top of that, you know, I don't want to rail too much on Cleveland, but if you've watched Cleveland at all so far this year, um, they just that, lost to the Colts. So I mean, yeah. there you go. <laughs> that's what I was gonna say. They just lost to the Colts. So um, I think, yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. Um, you know, when you think of home field advantage in the NFL. Oh, and by the way, Baltimore, who was our Week Seven opponent, they just got drilled by Jacksonville yeah, by about forty-four 50. to six. <laughs> yeah, I actually haven't gone back and uh, you know graded our picks from last week just yet, but I know that uh, we didn't do too hot with some of those. We didn't even think about that when we're like, yeah. all right, Baltimore. I yeah, mean, we just see who you're picking. I don't even think yeah. we actually made that pick. Yeah, um, going back to the home field advantage thing a little bit here. Um, you know, I think that. I think that home field advantage in the NFL is something that as fans we look at it and we're like, yeah, it's nice to play at home, but we still kind of ex- we have the same expect expectations on the road as well because you see guys like Tom Brady who, you know, murder in Foxborough and then essentially do the same thing when they leave, you know, and go play, I don't know, in Buffalo for example. It's it's always the same for the best quarterback. So I feel like home field advantage is something that we take you know, I think we take home field advantage for granted a little bit as fans, just because we don't fully understand what it's like to be under center and have crowd the crowd just beaming down on you one week versus you know silent the next. But I really do think that this home field advantage thing is a huge difference maker for a guy like Case Keenum, who is much more cerebral and much more um, you know built on his compete level and his personality. Like that's what makes that's what makes Case Keenum good. Um, I think I said this in the last show, but make sure to check out the the article that Andrew Kramer did on um, on Case Keenum and kind of basically selling us the fans on his personality because I think that that weighs into the equation quite a bit here, and then I think that it also conflicts with you know his personality and whatnot conflicts with playing on the road just because I think it's more difficult for a guy like that who doesn't have that much natural talent to be able to sort of not think and just play well, right? But I think that when I think that he's the type of guy where once he has the opportunity to like, you know, see his surroundings, go through his reads, um, I think the case is a much better quarterback. So I really do think it's underrated the fact the Vikings were playing at home this last week and we see this huge breakout performance from him. Obviously, you know, Tampa Bay was missing quite a bit of their starters. I don't feel bad for him. Because we, you know, Sam Bradford was out. Sorry, but like that's something to keep in consideration here. But as a whole, I think it's very important the Vikings are playing Detroit at home next week. If Case Keenum's going to be the guy, I think that this is you know a situation that he can succeed in. Um, we've seen in the past now that um, Case Keenum tends to play better at home. Oh, yeah. Small sample size, but again, I'd rather be playing at home with that crowd against Detroit in a meaningful game um, than not. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um... I mean, I don't think there's any question about that. I mean, the Vikings have always played better at home. Um, this goes back to before Zimmer. You know, it's, this goes back like, to before I mean, we were I, alive. When I'm saying better at home, I mean, I see every team in the NFL plays better at home. But I'm saying, like, there's usually been that drastic difference of the Vikings yeah. on the road versus the Vikings at home. So, and I think he's, Case Keenum kind of falls into that. But, I mean, there's no denying that this Vikings home field advantage, like Peter Schrager said, is elite in comparison to the rest of the NFL. So, um, it's really, again, like I look at that schedule, Detroit at home and then at Chicago, which, you know, again, the curse, but you know, Chicago's not a, a, a from what I've seen anyway, a, a super terrifying team to play against. If it had to be on the road, you get the green Bay at home, you get Baltimore at home, you get the neutral site game against the Browns. 
you know, I, I neutral site, aka the Browns' new home. But yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Um, yeah, I, I feel good. Cleveland about Jacksonville, just move them over there. They can yeah. just have their own division. Yeah, yeah. you you gotta wonder if like San Diego or Jacksonville. This is completely beside the point, by the way. But you gotta re, you gotta wonder if like the San San Diego or Jacksonville or someone. When is London gonna get its actual football team? It's got to be coming because they keep trying to make it happen, and you've got these so many of these teams in like you know questionable well, why is, situations. Why is every why is every like bad game over there? Like every you know or every poor opponent or whatever in the, or poor it's team in the punishment. league has the game. You know, like it's a Cleveland punishment. has a game over there. Jacksonville has a game every year over there. The Jets probably will this year. I don't know their schedule, but I'm sure they're on there. You know. It seems like an indictment on like teams that are bad. It's like, okay, if you if you played bad last year, we're putting you in London, which is so funny because Cleveland draws as much fans as anyone, right? Cleveland is like their fan I, base is super loyal. They, which is weird. yeah, <laughs> they suck. Don't get me wrong, but their fan base are on point. I love the Cleveland Browns fan base. They do not mess around. Same with Buffalo too. And Buffalo, I feel like it's another. I mean, everyone knows what Buffalo fans are like at this point. They have the they have the tailgate party in America for football games. So, I mean, I think it is odd to see which teams they pick to send to London. I, I, I'm i very grateful that the Vikings are playing an away game in London versus a home game because it's essentially taking off a home game from your schedule, which, you know, like we were just saying, it makes a big difference for the Vikings at least. So, um, all right, so from there, let, let's talk a little bit. Um, let's, let's get into kind of uh, – I'm trying, I'm trying to think of how I want to phrase this here. Um, just talk about a little bit more on just what the expectations the Vikings have created through through three weeks here. And, you know, the, the sample size, I, I'm going to mention this again because people love to, to throw sample size at me when they're, you know, trying to disagree with my points. But I'm, I understand that this is a small sample size. But what are your expectations for the Vikings Based off of what we have seen, you know the you know you know the upcoming schedule. You know Detroit. You know that we've got Chicago coming soon here. Um, what are your expectations for the Vikings at this point? Basically, what I'm asking you is, you do your school scale every single week on VikingsTerritory.com. What is your personal school scale sitting at heading into Week Four? Um, I have it at a seven, and it was at a five last week after the Pittsburgh blowout. Um, but I moved it up two spots. I'm the one the reason I'm not higher is because I'm wary of Case Keenum sustaining that or sustaining something similar to that. Now, obviously, it looks like, you know, having that many home games and the schedule is favorable for the next few weeks. Right. Um, but, I, I mean, again, it's Tampa Bay's defense was very depleted. Um, and Case, obviously, Case Keenum took advantage. But it, just looking at his career, looking at um, the way he has played, you know, even with, I think I've said this before, he's had a team that's had really good defense and some good weapons, but... His numbers haven't been phenomenal, so um, I'm wary of that. But you know, if if I knew right now Sam Bradford was coming back, let's say for sure, you know, either at Chicago week five or by Green Bay week six, I would probably bump it up a little bit. But you know, this team looks like a nine to ten win team. Um, the playoffs are certainly in the cards. Um, yeah. And I mean, they're technically leading the division right now. So after the next three weeks here, these division games, we're really going to see the NFC North shape up. And if the Vikings can win, you know, take at least two of these games. Um, it's going to really help them down the road. Yeah, you know, I, I'm I'm optimistic as well. Um, I would say that my school scales probably sits right around the seven eight range as well. Um, I still think this is a ten and six football team. And I don't think it's that absurd to think that just because Case Keenum is your quarterback. I mean, we have seen so many times where a quarter a team doesn't have a great quarterback; they just have a sufficient quarterback and a great defense, and that's what I think this team is shaping up to be. I mean. We saw how rattled Jameis Winston got in the fourth quarter when his team was down. The Vikings were a different defense up against Jameis Winston when the yeah. Vikings had the lead and they knew it. All of a sudden, Trey Waynes is playing well. What? What? Like, where did that come from? Andrew Sandejo. He's the best run defender in pro football focus. <laughs> he might, he, dude, he's been a great tackler. Andrew Sandejo, I mean, uh, speaking of guys that people throw a lot, of, a lot of crap at that probably don't deserve it, Andrew Sadeo might have just had the best game of his entire career last week, uh, just in terms of efficiency. I mean, he had an interception as well, but, I mean, he was hitting guys. I mean, the stopping power on his hits, I mean, he was waxing guys last week. He took no prisoners. Um, mm -hmm. you, saw him, you saw him take a step forward. Basically, what I'm ramping up to here is, by the way, Harrison Smith got his first interceptions in God knows when last week, too. So, thank God that's finally over, that uh, the drought is over for uh, Harrison Smith. 
Uh, but what I'm ramping up to is here is that we I think we saw not necessarily what should be the mean for the Vikings, you know, front to back, but I think that that's going to be the defense that you should expect every week was last week against Tampa Bay. That's what that's the defense I'm going to be expecting every single week. Uh, the offense now. I don't necessarily think it's going to be the same as last week. I don't expect for Case Keenum to throw for over 350 yards, given that he's done it three times in 28 appearances as a quarterback. But I do expect, you know, after seeing that he is capable of working the ball downfield, I do expect for him to be a, you know, a better passer than we saw in Pittsburgh moving forward. Yeah. I think it's only fair, you know. You know, you play at this, you know, you set this bar initially, then you jack it way up to this bar up here. Uh, I'm somewhere. I'm going to meet you in the middle. So I'm going to. My expectation moving forward is that Case Keenum could be a 225 plus passer. Dalvin Cook's only going to improve. And overall, my expectations have gotten back to the same place where they were at the beginning of this year, about 10 and six. I mean, did we? We probably saw two and one on the record, on the schedule anyway before yeah. the season, right? I mean, yeah, we all probably a loss at lose. Pittsburgh. Yeah, probably those two home games were wins. You know. Um, this, but I think now is where it gets tricky with Detroit because you know last year they were kind of the Vikings kryptonite. So um, I think weird, now, hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. how weird is that? By the way, just back that up for a second. That sentence that you just said—that Detroit is Minnesota's kryptonite. I mean, am I wrong? Am I wrong? I'm not saying you're wrong. It's just like, dude, that—that that is going to be a snippet <laughs> for social media. That whatever you just did. Um, um, all, all right. right. Let's we get, have some Twitter questions Twitter. Yeah, let's because, get the Twitter stuff here. because I think we have we have a good amount of them. So good. Kyle, I'm going to say this wrong. Kyle Splickall, Splickall, at Splick on Twitter. Um, the elephant in the room. With a great Bradford week one and Keenum in week three, do you think Teddy Bridgewater takes over in week seven um, when he comes back off the pup or has a QB carousel begun? How are you kind of looking at this quarterback situation? Well, I th- okay, so we we know that Sam Bradford's the starter, right? We could st- everyone knows that this is this is understood, right? Bra- Sam Bradford <laughs> is the starting quarterback. Okay, I would say that QB two is Teddy Bridgewater. If the de- like you know, assuming all three are healthy, quarterback number two is Teddy Bridgewater on this team. So yeah. if if Teddy Bridgewater is healthy and able to come off the pup list, you know, without issue i would say uh basically you know fans aren't or the coaching staff isn't concerned about his knee blowing up again i would say that yes he comes off the pup and be is the guy what would that be week nine or week 10 i would say week 10 let's look at week 10 as that's like, right after the bye yep yeah I, let's look at week 10 because that makes sense to me because after the bye you give him an extra week of prep you give him essentially everything he can to succeed in week 10 so i would say week 10 is where to look for teddy bridgewater and I would say that if Sam Bradford is not ready to roll, that Teddy Bridgewater would be the guy. Because I do think that the Vikings would rather start Bridgewater. At, if Again, once again, they have to be confident in his medical situation. But I, they would absolutely start him over Case Keenum, in my opinion. Right. Oh, yeah. I don't think that's much of a, you know, the question right now. I think it's just we still don't know about Bradford's injury status. Right. We don't know. Uh, Bradford we, we, is we, the we, guy. We, we've heard Teddy will come back, uh, will be activated immediately after, you know, week six when he's eligible to be out the pup. Um, but we don't know how he'll react to game play, you know, right. Getting hit, getting hit from. Yeah. We want to see that. I mean, that's different than just throwing and running around and doing, um, you know, calisthenics on the side. So, um, but crawling uh, around like a sniper on the sideline, right? A little bit different. Exactly. Um, but you know, I think another question that was posed to us was, um, by Joshua Gregory at big red 32, um, the QB situation looking like after this year. So I guess what from, you know, we don't know a whole lot, but what you guys you love project? to talk about the future. Yeah. You can't ever stay in the now. Yeah. You um, can't enjoy a Vikings win. <laughs> I don't, I swear to God, every podcast, every radio show, anything that I appear on, whether it's my own show or something else, it's always, what's the quarterback situation going to be like for 2018. And you know what guys, I don't know. Sorry, I don't yeah. have an, I don't have an answer. I, I mean, I could I could sit here and try to crystal ball this thing and like try to come up with some really hot take for you guys, but I know as much as you guys do. Honestly, everyone knows. Mike Zimmer knows as much as I do. 
on the quarterback situation for 2018. Yeah. Um, I'm really excited for the idea of Sam Bradford and Teddy Bridgewater competing for the quarterback one position next year. I think that that's probably like what you can look forward to because that's what I'm personally looking forward to. You know, Egan training camp get you know the first first time at training camp in Egan, and we're gonna get probably the ultimate quarterback one showdown. In my opinion, that's what I'm looking forward to for next year. See, prior to this year and after, especially after the week one, I was thinking, all right, Sam Bradford's the man. Let's do this. Let's sign to the extension. Right. Let's right. not worry about the, the distractions and everything with Bridgewater. But this injury that he has, from what I understand, it is essentially arthritis. When you have no cartilage left in the knee and your bones are rubbing against each other, and that creates that bone bruise. Because that, I mean, we, first of all, that was surprising that actually found, we found out it was actually a bone bruise, yeah. which I didn't feel like was real based on the way it was reported. But um, it, it is a bone bruise, and um, I think that will be something that limits him for the rest of his career. Like, it'll keep flaring up. Yeah. So that concerns me about him. We don't know how Teddy Bridgewater is going to play after the knee, you know, yes. recovering from that. So. I'm with you. I have no idea, but I'm a lot less confident right now that it's, you know, Bradford starting in 2018 than I was two weeks ago. I think this injury could kind of ignite the decline in his career, and it, it, it's, it's kind of a dark thing to say. But I mean, it's not. You're it's, not wrong. I mean, I mean, it's arthritis, from what I understand. There's not cartilage left, so the bones are rubbing against each other in his knee, and that. Well, that's what happened with Jay Ajay, right? Remember Jay Ajay, the Boise State running back, who's now the you know the all all you know all AFC style runner for the Miami Dolphins. I mean, when he was coming out of Boise state, they dropped, most people dropped his draft is his round grade from round one, round two ish to like round five. When they found out that he had no cartilage in his knee and that essentially, like you're saying, the bones were rubbing up against each other. And that creates that, you know, it, it, it creates that, uh, just an uncomfortable situation where it's, you know, sometimes it's, you know, it's gross and it's, it's, yeah. I, I, I don't know, and man. That, I don't. I mean, understand. I feel like too, like Brad, Bradford's had like seven ACL surgeries on that same knee. So like, and they're grade three, grade three ACL tears too. It's not like it's not like he's dealing with some like soft stuff. It's like he's dealing with the worst possible knee issue. Period. Twice. Besides Teddy Bridgewater. Twice. Uh, yeah. Other than yeah. <laughs> other than Teddy Bridgewater and Joe Theismann and whatever you know. But like between relative to the norm. I mean, he's done it twice on the same knee. I mean would you not expect some sort of like inflammation or whatever it is oh. going on there? But yeah, I think as a whole the answer, the answer to the question is we don't know. know. <laughs> I think the Vikings are all in on 2017 and they're just going to worry about 2018 when, when, when it comes. Let's do that. Um, yeah. Let's see. Let's get here. Eric at Godlike 0814. Um, he, this is more of kind of an observation than a question, but you know, when was the last time the Vikings had a quarterback that could, rip off a 300 yards and then a running back that could rip off hundred yards in the same game. I mean, I'm, I think back to, he's, he mentions, is it, has it been more recent than Favre or no, no, yeah. no. I mean, I mean, I mean, Teddy and Adrian in 2014, 15, but like the way that, uh, that offense was, yeah, it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't it, good. It, was it sucked. Constructed. Yeah. I don't think that, well, okay. 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 I think that giants game week 16. Was it last year? In 2015, 2015, when they blew out the Giants at TCF Bank, they might have gone. I, know I mean, Ted, the I know. point the point being here is that yes, the Vikings probably with Bridgewater and Adrian Peterson were capable of getting a 300 yard passer right. and also a 100 yard rusher, but it wasn't conducive to the system, right? It didn't make sense because every call they were making was either for Teddy Bridgewater or for Adrian Peterson, and more often right. than not, it was in fa- it was favoring Adrian Peterson's style of play, which as a whole was just making the offense, you know, simpler. Um, so, yes, I'm going to was... look at this box score because I feel like that might be the only example, in, in, you know, prior to the Favre era. Um, let's see. I mean, I – Nope, I, nope. Okay, Teddy didn't get to 300 yards, but Peterson did have 100 rush chance. Okay. So I think, anyway. I mean, the simple answer here is no. I mean, since Favre right. – Favre Peterson was really the last time that we saw an offense that was worked well in sync – that was capable yeah. of being I mean, a 300-yard passer or a 100-yard yeah. rusher or both. Yeah, I opinion. think I think the exact game is like the Baltimore game in 2009. I don't know why I know this, but I do. Um, anyway, we are going to go to the next one here. It's 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 our buddy Eli. Um, he wants us to talk about the Mike Evans um, Twitter, the 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 tantrum first of all on the sideline, then the Twitter um, 
contradictory tweet that says, you know, roads were open when he played against Xavier Rhodes, but his tantrum on the sideline says otherwise anyway. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't have a whole lot to say. Um, I, I think I said my piece, um, you know, over the last week with, you know, Bucks fans, but yeah, you have, <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I thought roads were closed. That's what I thought. I mean, that's what I saw. Yeah. I still have to go back. I'm going to do the coverage chart later on today. Um, we can talk about that a little bit on Friday. Uh, but my full expectation is that Mike Mike Evans was quote shut down. Um, he didn't have. He didn't score. He didn't do anything. You know. What did What did he do? I mean, even if the he had seven if, catches, but like, you know, uh, when you're when you're playing down by three scores, yeah. You know, the like Vikings what? are going to give you those dump off passes they for played, eight yards. And they were the in running. quarters coverage. They were. I mean, I it just hold this L, buddy. Like it, it's <laughs> just hold this L. I mean, like you lost. You your your Buccaneers lost. So you know. I that's mean, the thing that's up that upsets me is when. Remember when Janoris you know, Jenkins? That's was exactly it, what I was going to bring up. It was. Yeah. So Janoris Jenkins brings up his stats a couple of, what was it, two years so ago? One year ago? He had played he had basically, you know, shadowed Stefan Diggs. It was yeah. Rams Viking at TCF. And Diggs had like two catches for like forty yards or something like that. And this is right after the Rams had lost the game. He By goes like and ten. He highlight, highlight sheets of a sheet of paper with Diggs, like two catches, forty yards, and it's like shut down or something on Twitter. It's like you just lost the game. You like, lost, yeah. It's over. Like you don't that's get the most selfish thing in the world is to go up. You don't get to and, brag. You don't get to brag about your individual stats unless your team is also winning. That's what you don't pissed get to people brag off about. about getting, don't brag about getting open, even though you weren't open, even though you just got drilled by. I mean, yeah. It's it just like it, just because it's not your fault doesn't mean that you didn't lose, right? Like. You you don't need to like this is what bug, I think this is what bugged people a lot with Adrian Peterson is that even when the Vikings would lose Peterson was still really excited to tell you about his hundred yard day you know and I think that's what bugged a lot of fans at least for me I, I don't mean to speak for you know your guys' opinions but for me at least that pissed me off with Adrian Peterson and you know Mike Evans is he the reason that they lost this game no no he's not he he did his job to some degree he caught some balls he did his thing to some degree and that's what we said he was gonna do. I mean, did we not say – what was my example? Did I not say five catches for 50 yards for Mike Evans? Yeah, I mean, was I that mean, not, is that not verbatim what I said? That's your expectation, buddy. You're an elite top five NFL wide receiver. The roads may not have been shut down. It might not have been storm warning, but you were quiet. You were quiet, buddy, and you did not win the game for your team. Therefore, the roads were closed. You know, X go and give it to you. Sorry. Like, that's what X happened. X go give it to that's you. That's what happened. Yeah. That's what happened. I, don't, I think that's a I think that's a fantastic way to close the show because that was our last Twitter thought and um, I, I, the, the moving forward you know the Lions have Marvin Jones on the outside the Bears have somebody some person the the Packers have Jordy Nelson and then you get the Ravens I I, I can't even think is it Mike Wallace still it might is that be Mike the go to guy oh, I, uh, I hope it's Mike Wallace <laughs> you know and then you have Cleveland who has like mm, uh, yeah Rashard Higgins now some guy yeah, um, Higgins. Higgins I mean. I like Higgins. I do so, like Higgins. Xavier Rhodes just went through the toughest schedule, he, he'll, or the toughest set of opponents he'll face, and Thomas Brown and Evans. And now, you know, th- those numbers are going to go down significantly as far for as me, catches allowed, at least in my opinion. In my opinion, I think Rhodes basically can kind of – I'm not going to say he's going to cakewalk his way, but if he succeeds versus Jordy Nelson in, quote, you know, an NFC North impact game where everyone's watching – you know, there, uh, there are Vikings fans who don't watch games other than, like, Packers-Vikings, right? So, Rhodes hasn't been essentially been able to show out for everyone just yet. Um, if he goes in against Jordy Nelson and shuts him down, I think that it's just going to be case closed. I mean, I already am willing to say top five elite NFL cornerback, but I think that once he goes in to Green Bay and silences Jordy Nelson, that's when you'll finally get, you know, everyone – Packers fans included, you know, not talking about the intelligent yeah. ones. I'm talking about like just the, you know, the crazy ones too. I think that mm-hmm. finally we'll have to finally admit that. Um, you know, Week 13 at Atlanta should we, be fun. That's oh yeah, Julio Jones. That'll be fun. Too. I've already seen. Uh, that's the point, dude. That's the respect that he, that Xavier Rhodes is getting right now. It's because he's already getting you know the comments from people on Twitter saying wait till week thirteen and the picture of Julio Jones. I've seen that so many times. That's what like that's the level of respect he deserves right now. Honestly, 
it, 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 like he should be getting that like, all right, Julio's on the horizon. What's gonna happen? Type thing. That's what he has earned. From in my opinion, that's who mm-hmm. he is. So shut up, Mike Evans. That's what we say here. Shut up, Mike Evans. <laughs> All right, folks, that is the end of the About the Labor podcast for the midweek show. Uh, Like I said, we'll be back talking about the Detroit Lions more in depth uh, later on this week here. And then um, we will get the pregame show off at some point. Uh, Hopefully it's going to be this Sunday. Otherwise, probably just not going to happen, period. So uh, look for that this week. And um, Ball's in BJ's court as far as that goes. Yeah, ball is definitely in BJ's court as far as that goes. So, um, (laughs) yeah, so iTunes, uh, Stitcher, Google Play. Vikings territory, iHeartRadio. You guys know where to find us at Vikings ATL Pod on Twitter. And make sure to check us out later on this week for a full analysis of the Detroit Lions. Thanks, folks.